I'm going to take the liberty, if I can, to sit down this morning. I had a bad jump out of a helicopter in Iraq a few years ago, and I hit wrong. And I broke seven, uh, six vertebrae instantly, and I went paralyzed in my left leg. And they put in 12 screws and six rods, and now I have an artificial knee. I was on braces for years, several years after that. I finally kicked the brace. God restored my leg. I can, I can walk on a pretty good step, scare me a little bit. But, uh, and then I have a steel braid that holds my chest cavity together inside of me. My, uh, my, my body's torn up pretty bad. And then I have an artificial ear and a steel bar that holds that on. And I look through a clear eyelid that was made to protect my eye. I got all these spare parts. When I die, they're going to open the Ace Hardware at the cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome to any of the parts you might need. I put all my parts on the bed the other day. My wife said good night. I was in the other room. <laughs> That's a joke. Yeah. And you didn't get it anyway. So, but I sit down because um, I, I, my back just doesn't allow me to stand too long. And I'm 71, as I think was mentioned. Uh, Actually, I'm not going on 25. I'm going on 20. I, the common core math is wonderful. <laughs> I was born and raised down in South Texas. Uh, I was born on the Mexican border. My mother almost died when I was born. She never did recover. A long period of suffering that left her for decades in a, in a nursing home, curled up in a fetal position. And I used to think, wow, God did that to mom. Because people would say, Lois, repent, and God will heal you. And it sounded like it was her fault. And if she would repent, God could heal her. And I didn't put it together until later. I thought Jesus did all the suffering for our sin. So apparently Jesus didn't get the job done, so God takes it out on us because Jesus didn't finish the work. And if you believe that, I've got some oceanfront property in Phoenix. I want to sell you. It's a lie to believe that Jesus did not finish the work. He died once and for all. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Don't ever fall into that trap of judging people because they are sick or injured and say, well, God did that. God does not do evil. He's a good God. But he's a master at taking disaster and changing our tragedies into triumph. And I want you to know you're looking at a tragedy. Save only Christ that turned me into a triumph. And born to a woman that was physically incapable the rest of my life uh, till she died. I never saw her well a day of my life. And she never blamed God. None of that. She's shaking the fist. Why me, God? <laughs> and don't ask that. What if he answered you? Well, I don't know, George. or just something about you I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm building my case to tell you I got shot up in the war, but God didn't do it. God wasn't bored, elbowed Jesus, said, look, there's Dave. I can get him with one shot. <laughs> Boom. Way to go, God. Nice shot. You had to allow for windage, rotation, orbit, light years. Wow. Good shooting, man. No, God didn't do this to me. Uh, I want to make it clear to you that suffering is part of the human experience. And even Christ Jesus himself learned obedience through the things he suffered. I don't advocate suffering. I'm not saying let's go out here and stand in front of a bus and let it run over so we all have a testimony. I don't recommend that. But I take advantage of everything that happens to me. I, my motto is never let a good scar go to waste. The devil hits you, hit him back twice. He hits you twice, hit him back four times. I call it one-upmanship. Get one up on him. Every time he tries to hurt you, make him pay. Don't let him get by with it. Use it against him that God set you free from anything and everything the devil tried to do against you. And I learned out of my very youngest years that there were advantages out of suffering. Because my mom was ill, couldn't take care of me properly. We had a Mexican nanny, Maria Rubio. I learned Spanish before I learned English. I didn't speak English until I was in the, sixth gra in the first grade at six years old. They said I had to learn English. Then they told me I was not a Mexican. It blew my little Hispanic mind. <laughs> you are what you think. And so I had to learn English. And I was fluent in Spanish for many years. Then I get drafted and caught up in this war. And they made me an interrogator and had to learn to translate uh, Vietnamese and speak it. And to understand, even identify accents, regional accents. I could tell a North Vietnamese accent from the South Vietnamese accent. I was good at it. But the problem was... 
I learned Vietnamese, I knew Spanish, and I started intertwining, inter, getting my personal pronouns mixed up. I'd speak a little Vietnamese and call them in Spanish. And then they said, you, you, many, you must be Pentecostal. <laughs> so I stuck with that identity. I today identify as a Pentecostal and a man. Just want you to know that. And happy to be what God made me to be. Because in, in and of myself, I would have probably gone into pastoring. Although from the time I was young, I felt the call of God to be an evangelist. But pastoring was more likely what I would have gone into as a ministerial student at Southwestern. I had an exemption from the draft. I actually had a paper exempting me from going to war. But the morning that I was to take my physical, which you had to take it anyway, I, took, I went to take my physical. I had to wake up at 4 o'clock. My clock went off with a little click, and it put me into REM sleep, rapid eye movement. It's, you're not quite awake. You're not quite asleep, and you dream a lot right in that little period of time. And the voice on the news that came on with my alarm clock said, today in the northern part of South Vietnam in an area called the demilitarized zone, a young Marine was killed. That's all I remember it said. And I woke up on the floor. I so dreamed what I was hearing that I saw myself in my dream walking through a jungle. That's what I thought Vietnam was, which it is, but that's all I'd ever seen in the news. I was walking through a jungle. I came upon a dead Marine. I rolled his body over. I jumped so violently I fell out of bed because when I rolled the Marine over, it was me. I looked in my face, and it startled me so much I fell out of bed. My wife, quite amazing girl. She was not my high school sweetheart. She was my junior high school sweetheart. I was 16 when I asked her to marry me, and she slapped me. She said, well, I'm only 13. <laughs> I said, but you have the body of a 14-year-old. And she slapped me again. We had a rocky start. And she's leaning over the edge of the bed laughing at me. Are you okay? You fell out of bed. She said, are you okay? I said, no, I'm not okay. She said, well, did you hurt yourself? I said, no. Then what's wrong? I said, I'm going in for my physical I'm not coming back a civilian. She said, what? I said, I'm, I'm not going to come back a civilian. She said, baby, you have your letter of exemption. I know I'm not taking it. She said, please, please don't go. I said, I don't have a choice. I have to go. There's a, there's a Marine got killed this morning. I got to take his place. I went, and I left the letter at home. It was one of the most difficult decisions with the consequences that last to this very moment talking to you. I kissed her goodbye at the airport to go to Vietnam. I was trained by SEAL Team 1, served in Vietnam with SEAL Team 1, as I mentioned, a brown water black bird with the highest KIA, and as I walked away from her to go to war, she called my name, Davy, and when she says Davy, I, it's the most emotional name I've ever been called by my wife. I spun around angry at myself because I did not shed a tear until that moment when she said, Davy, tears came to my eyes. I looked back at my little teenage wife and she said, are you coming back? Wow, that hurt. I knew the statistics and I never told her. I didn't want her to know that there's a good chance I won't. So I lied to her. I said, I'll be back without a scar. Where'd that come from? I could have just said, I'll be back. Then I could be governor of California. <laughs> Where'd that scar thing come from? I think it was God's first revelation to me in little pieces along the way that I would not come back the same man she married. And I knew when I said it, I just made a promise I cannot keep. I ended up in Vietnam on a little small riverboat made of fiberglass. It do about 40 miles an hour. Depends on the weight load of ammunition. Our only defense was speed. It was made of fiberglass. You could shoot a pistol through the side of that boat. Think what an anti-tank rocket an anti-tank rocket of steel this thick, it can penetrate to penetrate what? A fiberglass that thick? There was no defense. I managed to get by for eight months without an injury, and on the last three days that I was in Vietnam, I was injured twice. The first injury was July the 23rd, 1969, when they opened fire in the worst firefight I'd ever been involved in, in an ambush that almost killed all of us, and yet none of us died. I was the worst injured, and it wasn't serious enough to keep me off the river except three days. And three days later, I was released to go back on patrol. 
I got back on that little boat knowing it'd be the, not knowing it'd be the last time I'd ride that boat. I was stationed in the southern part of Vietnam over on the western side near Cambodia in a jungle on a little river called the Vam Co Tay. And the Vam Co Tay is a northern tributary of the Vam Co. And the Vam Co Tay runs right up to the Parrot's Beak, it's called. And if you get a chance sometime in the future, look at the map of Southeast Asia. You'll see that from Saigon, now called Ho Chi Minh City, due west, you'll see what looks like a little parrot's head and a little beak. And it's called the Parrot's Beak, has been for many, many decades. At the peak of the Parrot's Beak, the river and the border of Cambodia only come a few miles apart. And it's at that exact point. That's where I was four days ago. They're making a movie of my life, and I was there looking at the very exact place. It's left me very emotional, and I'm still struggling with my emotions. I looked at the very place in the river where I jumped in. I thought if I looked close, I'd see my own skin floating away from me on fire the day it did when I was injured. I thought if I look close, I, or if I smell, I can smell my own flesh burning. It was so real. It was like it was happening again in a, in a sense, but I wasn't, I wasn't out of I went out of my mind, I don't mean crazy, but I went out of my mind of understanding where I was, but it was all so real. Maybe I can smell my skin burning. So today I'm here with a high sense of emotion and, and a little bit of jet lag. And if I go to sleep while I'm speaking, please wake me up. But that day on the bank of that river, on July the 26th, three days after my initial injury, I was back again to do an intelligence report. We were looking for remains of the bodies that we killed. That's hard to say. I'm a preacher's kid for heaven's sake. What am I doing killing people in a place I'd never heard of before? Life became so tenuous. I, I really, I didn't want to kill myself, but I didn't want to live. I want somebody to do that for me. And it's not Suicide by cop, it was suicide by communist. Let them kill me, get it over with, put this thing behind me. And that day I almost got my death wish. I picked up a white phosphorus hand grenade that burns at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I pulled the pin, I drew back. One second later I would deliver that grenade. It would burn down high brush, detonate booby traps, put up smoke. I was supposed to go down in that bunker and bring them out alive because dead men can't talk. I wanted to capture them. I drew the grenade back and I didn't realize it'd be my last formal act of war. When I drew the grenade back, I didn't know I was in the crosshairs of a sniper across the river and he took one shot. The bullet got there before the sound did. Suddenly, my life went up in smoke. I thought I was hit by a rocket, the rocket grenade, rocket propelled grenade that we were accustomed to having fired at us. I thought they got us that day, I thought they hit me. I didn't realize I'd been hit by a sniper and it was my own grenade. All I knew was, Dave Reaver's dead. I was dead as a doornail. In my mind, it's over. I'm dying for people I don't know. I'm dying for people that I don't have a relationship or friendship with. I didn't want to die. I wanted to live. I, I thought I wanted to die. I thought that would be the best thing if I could just get killed. Now I'm being killed, I think, and I wasn't sure I wasn't dead. I've never been dead. How do you know you're dead if you've never been dead? What, what happens one second after the last heartbeat. What happens then? Are you conscious of where you were to be absent from the body, present with the Lord? Does that mean presence of the Lord in a place called heaven or his presence on a place called earth? I didn't know that I wasn't dead. It's confusing, right? I'm, I'm standing there and I'm on fire and I look down, my face is on my boots. I look closer. I can see my heart beating. I felt no pain. I had no pain. I was in shock, but I never passed out. To save my life, I thought I got to get in the water, get in the water, and I jumped overboard in the water, and phosphorus burns in water. Water cannot extinguish it. it; has to burn itself out. I'm boiling the water like the heating element in a teapot, and I'm looking at my skin floating away on top of the river, on fire. I swam with incredible strength. I weighed 190 pounds that morning. I weighed before I went on patrol. I was trying to lose a few pounds I'd gained and I wanted to be in my best shape, not knowing God was inspiring me to get my body to the max uh, of its potential because it would take every ounce of strength I had to survive. I weighed 190 pounds. That night, they weighed the bed that I was in. They extract the weight of the bed. I had lost 60 pounds of flesh that day and not one limb of my body was blown off. It was all my skin and muscle tissue and fat tissue blown off. I could still see with my left eye, hear with my left ear. 
It blew off my face, except for what I covered with my left hand. That was second degree burn. It came back over here, my chest, back, arms, neck, face, all third degree. That means there's no skin. So they have to graft and they took skin from my legs and put it on my body. They said they found skin that would match my face perfectly. Then they told me where they found it. <clears throat> you wouldn't know if I was coming or going. If you didn't catch that, President Hagen will be teaching on that next week. <laughs> that grenade blew it, took it all. And I'm glad to tell you, I have my vision back in my right eye. They made me an eyelid that is clear. My eyes don't blink because the, the, the eyelids were blown off. The right eye doesn't blink. So I have an artificial uh, cover for my eye, uh, artificial ear, hair piece. My hair was blown off. You know, it was blown off in, si in, in South Carolina the other day in a high wind. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking at the Citadel Military Institu Institute and I was walking out with a four-star general on my right side and the wind caught my hair and the way it went like a frisbee out across that parking lot. <laughs> I take off chasing it and this little dog beat me to it. <laughs> and he brought the hair to me. How do you know it's mine? I, don't, I guess, anyway. So I don't mind the hair, just embarrassing sometimes. And there's a guy in China that is bald. <laughs> I got his hair. It says made in China. <laughs> That was pathetic, wasn't it? Now, maybe I should sit back down. I can think better off my feet than on my feet. And when the grenade blew, I, I swam across the river with uncanny strength. I, I got on the bank of the river, and I'm on my knees, and I'm looking at the damage, and these three fingers and thumb are hanging by tendons. Let me check my time here. It's getting, I got to hurry. I looked, at, and I'm pumping blood out of an open artery. I look at my heartbeat, and then it's Squirt blood out. I don't want to make you sick. I'm still alive. I could tell because I'm pumping blood out of my body. I'm not dead yet. And I watched a piece of that white hot 5,000 degree Fahrenheit chunk of that phosphorus down in the bullet hole that the blood was trying to come out. It started churning in that hole and it cauterized and sealed off that artery. And wherever I was burned, I should be bleeding. Now I'm seared. My skin was as hard as that table and became almost that thick. With, it was charcoal. And it sealed in all my body fluids. I didn't burn to death because I didn't lose my body fluids. I could have drowned. I, there's a thousand ways to die. There's only one way to live. And that's when Jesus says, you're not dying today. This is not your day. It's not your day. And a helicopter landed, picked me up, and they rode me on the stretcher, and I was still burning. And the stretcher caught fire, and it ripped open. I fell through on my head. You ever have one of those days? <laughs> Nothing goes right. They rolled me up in wet blankets, got me on another stretcher, and away we go. And they're running for the helicopter, and they slide me in. And the medic thinks I'm dead because they can't check for vital signs. I'm still so hot they can't touch my body. And away we go in the helicopter, and then the shock wore off. And the pain came on. I can't even begin to tell you what it felt like. I don't want to remember. I let that sleeping dog sleep. Don't kick that dog, right? But I can tell you how I reacted. It was so violent. The pain was, I just let out a yell. Medic! He thought I was dead. He almost jumped out of the helicopter. <laughs> the pilot literally lost control. The tail spinning. We're rocking and dropping. I thought, good Lord, we're going to crash and I'll be the only survivor. <laughs> They got me to Saigon and did emergency surgery and then got me on a big C-141 hospital jet and flew me to Japan and I got a hurry. In Japan, I asked for a mirror. It was stupid of me. They brought it. It was stupid of them. And with my good eye, I looked up at something I knew a teenage girl could never love. And I knew it was over. She could not love me. And I didn't want to live. And I took it out of the hands of God. I decided I'd take my life that day. It just wasn't worth it. You see, I was okay as long as I had a little hope. But when you lose your hope, that's your last line of defense against losing your life. You're going to kill yourself one way or another. Drink yourself to death. Eat yourself to death. You will shoot yourself to death. Hang yourself to death. You're going to die because you lost your hope. I lost my hope and I decided I'd take my life. I had no gun, no knife. 
I was more lonely than I'd ever been in my life. Totally alone in a moment that I would die and take my life doing it. So I pulled the tube out and I waited to die. And I got hungry. It was the wrong tube. I pulled out lunch. You see, you, you, you can die that way, but it's going to take a long time. And if you smell a pizza, you're singing, plug it in, plug it in. Because you really, you really, you don't want to die. And you can be so lonely on this campus that you think, you know what, I'm just going to check out. Don't give suicide a second thought. That's the one that'll kill you. You get lonely here. That's part of life. Campuses all over America have lonely kids on them. You feel away from your family, away from your friends. You're having bad grades. You're, you're not being able to pay your school bill. You, you dread every day. You dread waking up and facing another day. And you think, you know, death is easier than life. It's not. Don't take your life. Don't give it a second thought. Are you listening to me? Are you listening? Don't just hear me. Listen to me. Suicide is not your solution. Some of you need to hear that today. Jesus is still the solution. The devil did everything in his power. Shoot me, set me on fire. He did everything in his power to kill me. But I'm still here because no weapon formed against me can prosper. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. You can make it. There's not a devil in hell or out of hell can pluck you out of the hand of God. Hang in there, baby. You're going to make it. You're going to do it. You can see this thing through to the end. Don't quit school. Don't lose your vision. Don't lose your dream. Build on what you know that Kathy talked about so eloquently. Don't try something new. The old time religion is still the best time religion. It's the now time religion. Jesus hadn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can make it. Don't lose your hope, your last line of defense against suicide. They shipped me to America. They chewed me out for pulling the tube. Boy, I got a tongue lashing. I said, what are you going to do, kill me? <laughs> I've had worse. So they sent me to America to Brook Army Medical Center, where I'm a patient again today. And as a patient today at that hospital, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble seeing the time up there. I have to look, look at my watch. And I know some of you have to leave about now, I think it is. If you have to go, please know you're not, it's okay. Can, should I go ahead? Okay. Because there's something I'd like to share with you that puts it together in, in video. It's only four minutes. But to set that up, I, on 9-11, I tried to re-enlist, and they laughed at me. They said, you're already 100% permanently and totally disabled from your injury, not counting mental. <laughs> Drop the mic on that one. I said, what is it, mental? They said, 240%. I said, you don't know that. Leave me alone. You know? <laughs> Two weeks after 9-11, I got a call from the Department of Defense. They said, we want you to be a resiliency coach in the Comprehension Soldier Fitness Program. That's my putting it into a succinct word. It wasn't that simple. They didn't even have the Comprehension Soldier Fitness Program identified, but that, what I did then is exactly what I do now in that program. And I tour throughout the Middle East. And one of the most serious and heartbreaking jobs that I've ever done is as a resiliency coach. It was my job on many occasions, several occasions, to escort the remains of our fallen men in valor on the battlefield. I would escort their remains across from wherever they were killed to Baghdad. And from Baghdad, they were reloaded onto a long overseas plane, C-130 typically, and they were sent to Dover, Delaware, to the National Mortuary. I sat so many times with those engines grinding away through the night, and I'd look at those caskets and I'd say, therein may lie the cure for AIDS. He may have been the greatest doctor to ever live. Therein may lie a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Maybe therein lies the greatest missionary. Who knows? I couldn't pull myself together. I just I would weep through the night and deliver their remains, and then I didn't get to bring them home to America. I had to go back for more. So when I got to come home to America, and I got through all these surgeries that I've been going through, uh, we, we did something for the military. We built ranches, and I invested literally 
tens of millions in building this thing, these ranches and headquarters and expending money to build a place that was debt-free so I could bring them without them paying. I don't take government, con uh, government funds into our ministry. I'm personally paid in contract to do the work I do for the Department of Defense, but our ministry takes zero, zero, no money from the government. I'm not selling my freedom of religion for 30 pieces of silver. You got it? We're not for sale. Don't sell out to your government. Love your country. Serve the government any way you may, but don't let them take your freedom of religion or your press or speech or right to assembly. Are you with me? You know, the government is to reflect us. We should not have to reflect our government. Keep in mind what I'm telling you. Stay free at any cost because the blood that's been spilled to get us here should not be trampled upon to get us where others would like to take us. That, that blood wasn't spilled to take us there. So with that said, the day they brought me in, they put me in an isolation ward with 12 others. All of us were expected to die and all of them did. I'm the only one that survived. They let visitors come in that day. A woman walked up to the man in the bed next to mine he was 100% third degree, would not live. No one's ever survived that. She walked up to him, took off her wedding ring and threw it on the bed. And she said, you're embarrassing. I couldn't walk down the street with you. When she walked out, I knew the next visitor would be my wife, my little teenage wife. And I prepared for what I knew was coming. You can't prepare for rejection like that. And I knew it was over, and I studied the tubes to see which one would be the correct tube to pull. She walked up to my bed, read the tag on my arm. She bit down and kissed what was left in my face and looked me in my good eye, and she said, I just want you to know I really love you. Welcome home, Davy. There's that term of endearment. I said, baby, I'm sorry. I broke the promise that I would come home without a scar. I'm sorry, I can never look good for you again. She said, Davey, you, you never were good looking anyhow. <laughs> 50 years later, she's still my baby. Still my girl. the most loving friend I could ever have next to Jesus. I want to encourage you as I walk away from this mic today, take Ben Peterson's words to heart. Don't blow it while you're here. Make this the best days of your life. There are some of you who will make friendships that will last 50 years in marriage, God willing. Some of you are receiving your call to the ministry, maybe some of you this very day. Whatever you do, Never give up your hope. Keep your faith in Jesus. Love one another. Be the ab in the normal, the extra in the ordinary, the super in the natural, the cut above, the 10% above the 100%. I love you. My name is Dave Reaver, and I approve of this message.